And we are live. Is America really the land of opportunity for all? Doesn't gentrification actually make bad neighborhoods better for everybody? And wait a minute, would urban revitalization and an influx of capital even be necessary if Black people would just take care of their neighborhoods? Y'all, we are talking about it after the break. So we're doing something a little bit different today. We are live, y'all. I'm Amber. And I'm Erica. And this payday, we are talking about gentrification and the economic despair that you often see in Black America. So and welcome. Y'all know I don't do li- yeah, I don't do video. This is a really big stretch for me, Amber, to like actually be on video. We've got a whole guest and all of this at one time. <laughs> y'all memorialize this day. Yes. Eric, because Erica's face is live and on camera. <laughs> with makeup on, which she ain't told oh, nobody she was wearing makeup, but that's okay. Um, Erica's face is live and on camera, and the goal is for us to have so much fun that she wants to do it again and again and again. And be, that's why we had to have a special guest today. Um, and not only do we have a special guest for y'all, we are recording for the 2020 Virtual Prosperity Summit, organized by Prosperity Now. So if you've heard an episode of Brokish in the past, you know that we love our friends over at Prosperity Now. We lean on them a lot for research, um, for the studies and information that we talk about uh, on a lot of the episodes. So it is a joy for them to allow us to share an episode of Brokish at their conference. So thank you to our friends over at Prosperity Now. Hey, y'all. And so in addition to that, y'all, because we're coming with all the good news today. First, we got Erica on camera. Now we're part of the Prosperity Now Summit, and we have a special guest. We have Josh Poe with us today. He is an urban planner, a community organizer, and a geographer. And he has been in the game for over 20 years um, with scholarship, activism, and practical experience in urban policy planning and housing issues. And he is from the great state of Kentucky. Um, We are erasing the stain of Mitch McConnell off of y'all and replacing it. (laughs) With, with Josh Poe. Um, and he started his career doing grassroots organizing around housing, labor, and economic justice issues in Seattle back in the 90s. Um, and in 2017, he actually authored and published uh, the interactive story map, Redlining Louisville, Racial Capitalism in Real Estate, which received recognition from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government um, in its effort to recognize best-in-class data visualization. So. His research and activism is really around exposing racial capitalism in real estate science, creating counter maps, uh, debunking this notion that when we tell y'all what we're experiencing, y'all say we're crazy, right? So Josh is actually doing the real life work to say, this is true, this is happening, and the anecdotal stuff you're hearing about is not fiction. So Josh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today, and we are so honored to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to share this information and have these conversations. So I think um, it's a great space to have it in. I really appreciate you all recognizing uh, the work and, and uh, having me on the show. Absolutely. So um, Josh, you probably don't know this. It's kind of my job on the show to get into people's business. That's really what I like to do. So sometimes why Amber lets me do the pre-calls with folks because I can get into their business. But um, One of the really interesting things for me is when you talk about your work and you talk about all the things you're doing, you also talk about sort of where you come from and how that informs the things that you're doing and sort of how your personal story also um, contributes to, I think, the work that you're doing. So if you don't mind, can you sort of just give the brokers, that's what we call folks who listen to the show. So if you can give the brokers some background in terms of who Josh is and sort of where you came from and how that does inform your work. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's really important uh, to kind of quantify at the beginning. And, and, and one of the reasons, and I didn't talk about that for a while when I did the work, when I did the redlining research. And so I kind of got lumped in um, with kind of like this group that I really try to disassociate with of like, kind of like super woke white people. Um, <laughs> And so, are you saying, uh, Josh, you're like, those are not my people. <laughs> that's not really, that's not really my people. Uh, and so, um, 
and and nothing against people that do that kind of work but uh but this whole like sort of like idea of like white middle class allyship is just that's not really what i'm rooted in and so i started being a lot more open about my personal connection to the type of work that i do and you know i'm from appalachia i'm from eastern kentucky i was uh I've, you know i've worked in tobacco i worked in tobacco from there's no time i can't remember working in tobacco right and that's hard physical work uh, that not a lot of people were really willing to do in my community. So that's how I grew up is, is you know, very poor and, and, and in Appalachia. And if you grow up, you know, in, in Appalachia and, and you're poor and you, you know, are somewhat politically aware, you kind of realize that a narrative has been crafted about your community that vilifies the people in that community as really being the architects of their own condition and so has a, that's a similar story we understand that <laughs> yeah and so as a young person like struggling with that uh you know just feeling the uh, a lot of rage behind that and a lot of anger was something i i struggled with you know uh um uh, you know i'm in recovery so these things affected me they affect I, I think that's one of the things that happens to poor people is without a political analysis and without the political language to really explain what's happening we internalize those things and when we internalize that trauma and i think that happened to me as a, at a, you know, as a teenager, but, um, you know, radical politics uh, really kind of rescued me from that, from, from that and being able to explain, you know, the conditions of Appalachia from a material lens um, was something that, and understand capitalism, understand the functionalities behind capitalism, understand geographies. And so one of the things that happened is I, you know, like a lot of people from Appalachia, I moved to cities and moving sure. to cities, I kind of entered uh, middle-class white spaces for the first time, like that's something we don't really talk about a lot in this country is class segregation. So sure. I, I was never really in middle class people's homes as a kid, unless, you know, my grandmother cleaned houses and I was a carpenter. So I work for people, but that's a different relationship. And so sure. uh, having that relationship on the left in organizing spaces with that were middle class dominated spaces, uh, I felt uh, somewhat uh, alienated and somewhat marginalized coming from, and so I kind of navigated toward radical black spaces uh, in doing this work. And that's really where, that's really where I was kind of mentored. Uh, that's really how, that's the, that, that's the education that I received. And so when I went to college and became an urban planner and a geographer, I realized that there were conversations that weren't being had in those spaces because we weren't really willing to talk about race really willing to talk about racial capitalism and really willing to acknowledge like the history of redlining and so that research really came out of this there again back to the idea that, that we have a real responsibility to produce counter narratives to the dominant narratives that are very harmful to the long sort of paternalistic narratives that we have in this country that poor communities and black communities uh, and brown communities don't know how to supervise themselves right really lack knowledge lack skills uh and 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 and, and are really you know the, the 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 architects of the conditions in those communities and so that's been looking back at my work for 20 years that's what i've been doing and then in january i started the research root cause research center uh with uh, jessica bellamy who's the co-founder um, and she's from smoketown in louisville so she's from uh, uh one of the oldest black neighborhoods in louisville and i think a lot of the root cause research center's work comes from our shared skill sets of wanting to create data visualizations and counter maps but also comes from our shared geographies of being from smoketown kentucky being from eastern kentucky and appalachia you know ruth wilson Gil gilmore calls calls these places forgotten places right so so much of, of rcrc's work is about being from those forgotten places and really uh forming some sort of solidarity around that and so i don't come to this work i don't like the term ally I don't really like like the idea of, of that, of, and I, I'll just I name names. I'm sorry, but but I, so oh, I, we love it. Please to, name all the names. I try to distance myself <laughs> from people like Tim Wise or Robin D'Angelo or Richard Rothstein because those are very middle class spaces. I don't really see my work as rooted in allyship, uh, because where I'm from, people are dying. Yeah, it's a real experience. Like it's they're not, not theoretical. The, yeah, they're not dying the same way that black that 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 the police are murdering black people. But uh, of the 10 counties in this country were, were with the lowest life expectancies, eight of those are in Appalachia. So the same, the same mechanisms of capital that are murder murdering uh, innocent black people are also murdering my people. Uh, and so I, I prefer the, the term comrade, that we have a material interest 
uh, in, in forming these sort of, 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 of bonds and, and, these, and, and these solidarities uh, because nobody's going to get free unless we're all free. So why do you think white supremacy is so disruptive in that camaraderie, right? Because one of the things we know from places like Appalachia is that these are places that are um, deeply impoverished, so much environmental injustice, right? So much in access to healthcare, food deserts, a lot of the same things that we see in black Absolutely. urban Drugs, you know, drugs are shipped drugs, in those areas. Yeah, so opioid drugs. addiction. Nobody's Absolutely. growing poppies in, in Eastern Kentucky, right? Exactly. So why do you think that white supremacy is so disruptive to a class solidarity between sort of all of these really marginalized groups um, when there's clearly a commonality between them? Um, why has white supremacy been so disruptive in the formation of a, a camaraderie where really it seems so obvious that there should be one. Wow. I don't even know where to start. I think <laughs> we have to go back to Europe uh, uh, before, you know, before the United States even, right? And I think we tend to think of racial capitalism as being black and white, right? As being, sure. you know, as starting with the enslavement of Africans and and I think you've got to, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore writes about this a lot. I mention her a lot because she, uh, she's amazing. Uh, she writes about how you kind of have to go back to Europe. Racial capitalism existed before black people entered that space. And so at that time, uh, uh, you know, you had, you know, Eastern European, Slavic people, Irish people who were really um, the, the sort of bottom caste in that system and the exploited class. Um, and so capitalism kind of produces difference, right? It's designed to produce difference uh, and, and, that, and that production of differentiation prevents worker solidarity from happening. And so when I did the research on redlining, it took me years to kind of come to this, but I realized that our housing policies and, and most of our policies in this country are designed to crush that sort of worker solidarity. Um, recently, so, you know, the real, the real architect of redlining was Herbert Hoover and the architect, he was one, also one of the architects of zoning. And so in the 1890s, what you had um, were these mining engineers and, and from the United States, these mining, mining engineers would travel all over the world. They were really celebrated. And so they were traveling all over the world and they were really studying labor practices. Very specifically, they were studying how to use race has a management tool, has a worker management tool. And so they would introduce different races of workers to crush strikes. So for instance, Herbert Hoover went to Australia and workers were gonna strike. He brought in Italian workers and kept, and, 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 ha and had a place for the Italian workers to live that was totally separate from the rest of, of you know, like the native, um, the native population. He did that in South America. They did the same thing in Appalachia when they would be a coal strike, they would bring in black workers and then they would, you know, they would design their living quarters to be far away from the white workers. And so we have this sort of housing um, pattern that became a part of our national housing policy. And so, you know, in the early 1900s, you had a massive labor movement, right? At the same time, you had a massive wave of, of Eastern European immigrants moving to the United States and those workers from Eastern Europe were very radical. They, you know, they come from, they came from a background of socialism, came from a background of communism. At the same time, you had a massive wave of black migration coming from the South, fleeing white terrorism. And those folks were living in the same neighborhoods. They were living in densely packed apartments. Uh, they were living in urban areas. And a lot of those immigrants were not considered white in 1917, right? Italians weren't considered white um, Irish people weren't really considered white. And so Herbert Hoover in 1924 brought together a group of urban planners um, and convened what they called the Hoover Advisory Commission on Zoning. And that was, that's really the foundation of zoning in this country. And it's really the foundation of, of also our economic system. Out of that commission, the finding, one of the findings was that a realtor should never be, a realtor should never introduce any race that would be a detriment to property values. So it's basically codified into federal policy that black people would be a threat to property values from that point forward. And that really, that's really what set redlining in motion. Sure. And what that means, you know, simply is that the, the human geography 
that, that the human, you know, the physical space that black people occupy is not only a threat to their own ability to acquire capital, but it's a threat to anyone in proximity to them. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. We're if, the contagion. Sort of a contagion, right? So if capital moves into a neighborhood, uh, black people have to leave that neighborhood, right? And, and so that is, um, that's so important to think about. And so all those groups of immigrants um, who weren't white in 1917, right? By 1945, you know, they're grilling hot dogs in the suburbs. They're white. They've been assimilated into white middle class space. Um, and, and they don't live next to black people anymore. And so a program was, that was started by uh, the National uh, Board of Realtors was taken over by the um, Labor Relations Board. Taken, it was a private program taken over by the federal government. And basically what they determined was one of the ways to break strikes and break cross-racial solidarity is to assimilate people into middle-class homeownership because homeowners don't go on strike. Right, if you've got a bunch of workers and they're living in, in apartments, they can develop mutual aid networks, they can develop all sorts of relationships that's gonna sustain a strike. But if you lock people into 30 year mortgages and make them individual homeowners far outside the city, um, those strikes will stop. Wow, I've never thought about that connection before um, between homeownership and not wanting to strike or probably unionize or. Well, there's also the idea that property that, that citizenship in this country is predicated on property rights. And so you really are, you know, so black people, by, by being locked out of land ownership, black people in this country never actually gain the full rights of citizens. And we see that here in Louisville where the police can enter the home of Breonna Taylor, murder her legally. She's not given, we see it every day. Uh, black people just aren't, never achieve the full rights that property owners achieve. So one of the things I wanted to ask you as an extension of that is when we look back, so we got these white landowning men who formed this nation, right? And now we have tied sort of everything else to land ownership. How do we sort of as Black people, now that we recognize this intentional disenfranchisement that's happening, how do we advocate for ourselves now in this political climate and say, okay, we recognize this is an issue what should be our ask in response to that? Because it seems like this is in the bowl of the DNA of who we are, right? I mean, you got white landowning people who didn't trust poor people. That's why we created a whole uh, electoral college. We got, you know, white landowning people who try to make it harder for poor people to, you know, do all of the things that we now consider as American as apple pie. But this is very clearly still going on. So how do we advocate for ourselves in light of that? as a collective people saying, this is the problem we recognize, what, what should we say we want done about it? Well, I don't think you can have any conversation about that with, you know, it kind of, it starts with reparations and it ends with reparations, right? And there's just no way out of that situation where you've got a group of You've people. got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even if you look at, even just, I mean, not even making a moral argument, but just in terms of how do we prevent the entire, you know, collapse and economic devastation of the black community uh, in the next 20 years. Um, you know, that's what a lot of people call closing the racial wealth gap, which I don't like to use that terminology. Uh, but how do we do, because I don't think it really contextualizes um, just the massive devastation that we're going to see economically. Um, but I don't think you can have that conversation without talking about reparations, right? And so there again, you know, that goes back to the boys who said that reparations has to involve land. And, and right now with Dr. Sandy Darity's work, um, anything I say is just going to be repeating what I've read from Darity or, or, or Du Bois. But I think it starts there and it, and it ends there. But, but deeper than that, and this kind of goes back to the second question, even with reparations, you're still left with the contradictions of capitalism, right? And so... And, and, it, and, and I think this is really how the white working class and poor white people have been tricked. We can't have 100%, uh, we can't have 100% employment under capitalism. Just can't do it, right? right? And so that means we got a whole lot of people walking around that can't get a job and they, they're not willing to just say, okay, I'm gonna be a sacrificial lamb to capital and, and, and starve and sleep on the street. They still want to have things. 
uh, they still want to be able to eat. And so they do things like sell drugs or her, you know, or what, what have you to try to make money. And then we have sort of a surplus population management plan where we, we put those people in cages. We've got a prison industrial complex to manage that. We've got a military industrial complex, which is where a lot of my people end up. And we have a growing nonprofit industrial complex that sort of like gives the illusion that we're doing something about this surplus population, but we don't really look at it as it's surplus population. It's just built into the contradictions of capital. We look at it as, uh, black people can't control themselves, right? We like white people don't turn on the news every night and see, Hey, this is, these are, these are how we dealt. This is how we dealt with the contradictions of capitalism today and surplus population. What they see is that black is synonymous with poverty, right? And that they aren't actually poor. And so you got a lot of people out where I'm from uh, who make 20, $30,000 a year to say they're middle-class. Yep. We know $25,000 a year isn't middle class, <laughs> but that's what whiteness allows us to do. All we ever, all we want is to be able to blend in with yep. the middle class. You can't see us, right? You, we will buy a fancy car, uh, but we'll live in a trailer. And so that's what whiteness has done is it's created this illusion of, of superiority. Uh, du Bois called that a mental wage or psychological wage. Uh, and, and so by, by making poverty so synonymous with race, we don't deal with that on a systemic issue. And what we really need in the face of that is massive labor organizing. So um, there are so many things I want to talk about, Josh. So let me pick, <laughs> pick a path because there were, there were just a few things I wanted to go into. So um, let's go back to the concept that you were talking about just in terms of the historical roots of redlining and real estate. And I know many of us, you know, especially those of us who might live in, I, I'm, I'm from Houston originally, and it breaks my heart when I go and see where my grandmother and my grandfather lived. And now to see, you know, sort of all of these condos built in that place. And it just isn't, you know, the third ward that I knew and grew up in, right? So mm. um, gentrification is just, it's just so unreal to see the changing landscape. But if we talk about that, right, and go to the formal definition, uh, the process of renovating and improving a house or district so that it conforms to middle class taste, right? So that was one definition that I found, right? And of course, I'm rolling my eyes because middle class, read, white, wealthy, whatever you want to say there, right, Um, in terms of making a place palatable for those folks. But just talk to us about gentrification and and how it has these effects, not only in housing, but education and food insecurity, public transportation, how all these things are linked to this notion of housing and and gentrifying neighborhoods. Yeah, wow, there's a lot there. Um, (laughs) and, And so I don't like that definition. Uh, it's, <laughs> we agree. Uh, yeah, but, and one of the one of the things that we do at Root Cause Research Center is we don't believe that universities and institutions should own the means of production for knowledge and data. We believe that knowledge and data should be owned and controlled by communities, um, and that 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 definition is is a good example of that. That's how academics would define gentrification, or how a, maybe a nonprofit who has you know a lot of landlords or developer interest on their board might define it. Uh, but the, the LA Tenants Union defines it, and that's why I think it's important that tenants and renters get to define what Absolutely. it is. They define gentrification as replacement of poor people for profit. Uh oh. Talk think, about it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's when you start making things really simple and easy to understand, you can start developing strategies to attack them and, and dismantle them. So, wait, uh, you don't so, believe information should be weaponized? to be used against people? You, you think information should be egalitarian, Josh? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> like that we should use like simple ways to define things so that like everybody can understand it? Very oh. much so, yes. Ooh, and, very much, yeah. and, very, and very much weaponized against the ruling class um, and, 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 for, you know, and for, for a complete liberation. That's kind of what the root cause, that's what the root cause research centers here, that's kind of our, that's our brand, right? So um, yes. Um, but getting into, getting into it, uh, just to give, I'll just use Louisville as an example because Louisville's international news right now. And it's, it's an interesting case study because it's one of the last cities to really gentrify. So we're kind of watching that happen in real time. But going back to the, going back to the 1924, going back to zoning, right? Let's, let's, let's think about zoning and what zoning is for. So traditionally, 
wealth has been created in real estate through sprawl, right? Through, you know, capitalism can create a market and it can produce value uh, and, and, and bring something into production. And what it's brought into production for years has been new land. Cities keep sprawling, we keep acquiring land and that land, you know, developers are getting wealthy from buying land in, in uh, rural areas, say that land zone agricultural. I'm a developer, I buy land, it's zone agricultural, I go to the planning commission, I got some buddies on the planning commission, they rezone it residential, bam, it's now worth three million more than it was worth. That's wealth creation, simply through public policy, right? Has, we're now in the, in the production of urban spaces, we have an inverse of that, and since racial zoning never really ended, right, we still have racial zoning. So as, develop, as development and capital moves into black communities, the black people who are there are basically placeholders for depressed land values, just like the expansion of Europe was created because they needed new land and, and Native Americans. It was, it was easy to take the land from them. Same thing's happening now. So development and capital move into black communities and wealth is being created through buying a house from a black family for 40, 50, $60,000. Uh, putting a little bit of capital into it, attracting the white residents, which is the key, right? And then, then you resell the house for two Breaking it up. Yeah. There's a whole process here, though, right? Nonprofits play a role in that. Artists play a role in that, right? I can't tell you how many gentrification processes I've seen where Black people are being moved out of the neighborhood, displaced from the neighborhood, dispossessed from the neighborhood, yet murals black people are going up at the same time. So we're celebrating this image of, of, of most level of, of black women and black art while we're actually materially dispossessing black people of their land. Um, and so in, the, in Louisville, you have a neighborhood called Russell. Russell is directly uh, west of downtown, right? Uh, it's 90% black. Median income there is about 17,000 a year. Wow. Uh, it was home to uh, one of the city's largest public housing sites. It was the traditional uh, black commercial district uh, up until the 60s. And like a lot of cities went through urban renewal. Uh, urban renewal really targeted Russell and basically destroyed whole parts of Russell. And so the city expanded east about as far as it could go. Around 2014, it decided to move, to, to move into Russell, really, uh, from, really resulting from speculative capital investment by some of the Whiskey Dynasty families here in town. So. Um, has does that that whis how far does that whiskey money go back, just as an aside? Like, is it goes the whiskey all money the like way. slavery it goes, money? It goes all the way back. Yes, okay. right? Okay. I mean, slavery cuts right to the bone. Okay, sorry. Especially in places like Louisville. A black man taught him how to make the whiskey, girl. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. These are plantation sorry. dynasties. And if you think about Louisville, Louisville's a place where antebellum culture is still celebrated, right? Think about the Derby. Uh, actually, Louisville was a. Uh, kind of became the capital of the Confederacy after the Civil War, right? So the mm -hmm. South is occupied. I'm going to get, I'm doing a sidebar. I'm going to get back, but the South we is like sidebars. The South occupied, right? Those Confederate officers and generals didn't want to live under Union occupation. And much like the Nazis after World War II, who went to Argentina, where they were still celebrated and mm -hmm. respected, a lot of Confederate officers flocked to Louisville. And they became the city's elite. They became the politicians, the journalists, the school board, the lawyers, what have you. The cap, you know, the Southern Baptist Seminary moved from South Carolina to Louisville after the Civil War, which is kind of like the Vatican of the Confederacy, right? And so the Kentucky Derby is basically a Confederate memorial pageant. And so what's, what's important about that, though, is Never that those, about it. those plantation dynasties had a management system very much like Herbert Hoover had a management system that was a way of controlling workers through racism and through the, and through the, 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 the production of, 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 of produce, the produce, production of identities and the production of differentiation. And so here we are in 2015, the same plantation dynasties are now making speculative investment in the West End. Uh, since, it's, um, since it's a small city in the South, there's not a lot of capital floating around. You know, it's basically hoarded with, you know, Louisville's like you've got five or six families that have all the wealth. There's not a lot of capital flowing into the city. And this is why gentrification in smaller cities 
is a lot different than it is on the coast or in Chicago or a large city because that's mostly private capital doing the gentrifying. In small cities like Louisville, it's public investment because the speculative capital doesn't, it, it, it has to generate revenue somehow and it has to generate more investment. So they need our tax dollars because there's no, there's no capital um, anywhere else. Um, they want to attract like Google and Amazon, but they, they're never successful. So now you have public policy um, really gentrifying the neighborhood. So one of the first things that happened, uh, the city gives a bunch of land to a nonprofit developer and gives them a forgivable loan to redevelop market rate housing. Market rate housing in a neighborhood with a median 17,000. We then demolish the public housing, displace over 700 families right from the neighborhood. That site's now controlled by a private developer out of St. Louis named McCormick and Baron Salazar, one of the largest uh, uh, affordable housing developers in the country, got a lot of the Hope Six dollars, getting a lot of the Choice Neighborhood dollars. They have a nonprofit called Urban Strategies that does case management, right? And this is how a lot of private developers are doing it. You start a nonprofit uh, and they do the case management. You get the grant to redevelop. They get the, the, the contract to do the case management. The public housing residents are complaining to their case manager about what's going on, not realizing they're talking to the landlord because the landlord is the chair of the not for the nonprofit. Um, that's sort of how nonprofits function. And that also enables them to access private dollars through rent, public grants, and uh, foundation money. That's why, that's why they started the nonprofit. But in the 70s, uh, they went to the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation said, you guys are private. We can't give you money. But if you start a 501c3, you can access all this capital. Um, so Beecher Terrace is now demolished. Uh, and a lot of nonprofit developers start making uh, uh, start buying up property in the neighborhood. And so there's basically a plan to gentrify the neighborhood that's moving south through Russell. Um, one of the problems is that you have a lot of drug activity on one street, right? And so there was a man lived that, who lived there who sold drugs named, named Jamarcus, uh, Jamarcus Glover, uh, who was Brianna Taylor's boyfriend. The city uh, targeted his home um, and use the police as a mechanism to get him out of that home because they wanted to buy the property. And so in order- This all goes back to property ownership? It goes back to, pro it goes back to dispossession because keep in mind, you've got, my, my point in this is, you've got a ton of investment now happening in this neighborhood, right? Billion, almost a billion dollar of investment. That investment has to get a return. And the only way to get a return is to attract white residents to that neighborhood. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And we, it's so interesting because you talk about woke progressive people. When I went to college in DC, I wrote a paper on urban pioneers in which is what they call woke white people who move into gentrifying neighborhoods. And at that time it was a bunch of <laughs> young gay black, a young gay white men moving into Southeast DC, moving into Capitol Heights areas like that. And so it's so interesting to hear this very intentional conspiracy because what the optical illusion is then is that, oh no, I'm an ally. I live in the ghetto, right? So I, I'm an ally. I run a nonprofit that helps people in gentrifying <laughs> neighborhoods. So it's almost like the conspiracy metastasizes and then gives life and validity to a lot of horrible, horrible things happening that are dispossessing and displacing black people. But those are the same very people we turn around and pat on the back and say, attaboy. Good job. You're doing the you're doing the righteous work, and so it is so interesting to hear you say that that is not only a conspiracy, but it is an intentional conspiracy fueled by the very people that are out here trying to take credit for doing and being something that they totally are not. Why didn't would, you tell me to put something besides water in here? I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even. I wouldn't call it a conspiracy. I would call it just it's a plan. In it's inevitable though. It's inevitable with how capital operates. So once you make a group of people, uh, 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 once you define them as a agent to wealth, when capital moves in that neighborhood, investment returns are predicated on their banishment. And, I, and, and this, is, this is what racial banishment is in order to get those. And so the police have, have always played the role of enforcing and protecting that investment. And so the Breonna Taylor murder is, is very much in line with everything we see happen in gentrifying neighborhoods in Cincinnati and over the Rhine. It happened in the early two thousands. So Josh, which was a group of, I'm oh. sorry. 
uh, 3CDC was a, a, a corporate conglomerate, started gentrifying the neighborhood in Cincinnati and over the Rhine, hired the police to work off duty. Guess what? Young black men started being murdered in the neighborhood. We had riots in Cincinnati in 2002. As Louisville starts to gentrify in 2020, they hired consultants from Cincinnati to basically show them how to do this. Developers took tours of over the Rhine from Louisville for the last five, six years. So guess what? They're using the playbook. We have police murders. We have riots 20 years later. Josh, I just, I just can't keep letting you tell me stuff like this because it's, it's a lot. Like, I really in my heart want to believe that these things are accidental. But I mean, there is a very clear plan that apparently a lot of folks are in on and we are just oblivious to all of these things going on. But because you are in Louisville, can you just kind of um, tell us what's going on in, in Louisville or Amber, do you have any specific things kind of that we, we want to hear about? One of the things Erica and I were talking about shortly before we started recording is I asked her, had she seen the photographs that were coming out of Louisville today of the city boarded up and, you know, basically being treated like a war zone in anticipation of a strike um, because there was supposed to be an announcement today regarding the charges or lack thereof against the officers who murdered Leona Taylor in her home. And I was just absolutely floored when I saw those photographs. Um, they are propaganda. They are propaganda of the highest kind. And it just, I mean, they had even like a, some kind of industrial saran wrap around. And it, there was a shell station. They had the gas pumps like wrapped up and with like a sort of industrial ties around them, buildings boarded up. And it was just, um, it was ghastly. It was ghastly. Yeah. What you have in Louisville, what you had in Louisville on May 28th was a massive uprising in the city from the community. What you've had since then is counter-revolutionary activity. Don't believe anything that's coming out of Louisville right now. It is all propaganda. It's counterintelligence. Y'all call Josh. We're going to call Josh for our news from Louisville. Or, or talk to the people who were there on May 28th uh, because you've had a lot of people claim space that maybe they didn't occupy. A lot of, you know, when you have that type of uprising, um, counterintelligence measures go into effect, right? And you're right, that, that, that is designed to produce a narrative uh, that instills fear in the heart of the white community here and, and further vilifies Breonna Taylor and further justifies uh, her murder. Everything that's happened since May 28th, the police and the city have gotten exactly what, what they've wanted. As a former prosecutor, I can tell you that so much of what has happened has been designed to stoke the very things you're talking about. Um, we arrest people every day on probable cause warrants because the question is, did they probably do what they are accused of doing by the arresting agency? Um, People have been arrested on far less than we knowing <laughs> that they shot the bullets that killed somebody. And so this, this really um, disturbing narrative that insults intelligence that we are investigating. You know how many people sit in jail while the police investigate their cases? Okay, do you know how many people get arrested and get a bond hearing while the police investigate their cases? So it's just- Not the in, officers, you know, I mean, yeah. that's the- but it's just been an absolute insult to the intelligence of not only the people in Louisville, but the people across America who are sort of being- And the world. Really, and like, the world, really. This yeah. ludicrous line that there's some type of investigation going on where you know exactly who did, what they did. The only question is, is there a justification? And that has absolutely nothing to do with the standard you look at when you are evaluating a probable cause warrant. So it's very interesting that you know, like you talk about this concerted action is coming out to sort of dis distract from the fact that this is really very simple. It's really very simple. Yeah. Yeah. For weeks after the uprising, the mayor of Louisville uh, said over and over again that they could not fire the officers because of the labor contract. And the media just repeated that. And, and, I, and I think it says a lot about, you know, what we know about Louisville now that the world kind of sees it, like this is a place with some serious, serious problems with, with racial injustice and oppression. And, 
you know, we actually had a labor lawyer look at those contracts and publish their findings. And over time, uh, he, you know, the media kind of backed off that. But it's um, the damage is done by that point. The damage yeah. is done, right? I mean, it's in the and it's and it's so there's such an effort here, and there's such a coordinated effort with the police, with the city, with developers, with nonprofits, um, and the media is so complicit in this of controlling that narrative. Narratives are tightly controlled in cities like Louisville, Kentucky. You're talking about small southern cities, right? And uh, the ability per, to produce counter narratives and get counter narratives out is is very difficult. And I will also say this is just a complete aside, but it also just shows how the system conspires and works together to protect the people that it wants to protect. Because even if they weren't fired, I personally think that would have been a, a little bit of a problem. There are certain rights police officers do not have when they are in the course and scope of employment. One of which is you cannot invoke a right to remain silent. It's called the Garrity exception. You have to talk after a shooting. And so it's very interesting, this investigation you are conducting, because the benefit of Garrity is that the officers have to talk. The statements can be used against them in criminal proceedings. So my point is, all of this has to happen in a relatively small amount of time. It is going to be October. What are you doing? You have already collected these Garrity statements. You already know what happens. What are you doing? Because you got time to board up the city and wrap up the gas pumps. What are you doing? Josh just finished but telling part, you that's the police were in cahoot. Like he just finished telling you that the police went to go try to get this property. Now they have to protect this property from another uprising. Like apparently, well, child. And so on the street where Jamarcus Glover was killed, the city has bought almost every property on both sides of the street, along oh, with one of their favorite nonprofit housing developers. We just did a blog post about this on our website rootcauseresearch.org, but the, but the length of the investigation is very purposeful, right? It's very strategic and it's designed to wear people out. And while you're wearing people out, there are entities who are involved in the movement who are discrediting the movement. So you sow division, you sow mistrust, you sow all those things within the people who were responsible for the uprising. And by the time, by the time you make the announcement, the leaders of the protest have changed. And I'm just, I'll just leave it at that. So you're not going to name anymore? Okay, I'm not going to be that messy, yeah. Josh. Don't, don't name any more <laughs> names. We, <laughs> you actually live there. We need to... Yeah, and we have a lot of people coming from outside the city who are now leading the protest also, and they're not always in coordination with local organizers. So uh, it's been... Has a, has, a, has, has a study of sort of counter-revolutionary tactics. It's been really invaluable as a citizen of Louisville and as a Kentuckian, it's been sh just shamefully devastating. Absolutely. So um, I know we're sort of getting close to the end of our time together. There are some, some now like sort of rapid fire things we kind of just want to get your thoughts on, if that's okay. So I'm just going to yell out a few things and let's talk about it um, just because I'm interested in messy at the same time. So these may have nothing to do with the topic at hand, but because we're here together. Um, let's talk about for a second, the NBA strike. What do you think about what happened there? Oh, uh, wow. I think that's a really good example of just neoliberal policy at work, right? So we, we have, I think we're going to look back on the NBA strike as one of the most significant labor uh, issues of our lifetime. I can't think of any labor strike that's happened that happened on that scale. And so what did it last about a day? If. And, and so <laughs> Obama comes in and basically says, I mean, if you think about, think about the, the power that would shift in that strike, right? Uh, think about how much investment would be lost by the second in that strike. Uh, and that's what, that's what organizing is, right? You, you, you form a, a, a strategy that targets various axes of power, and, and, and those are the pain points that you target. And so Obama steps in and basically says, no. Neuters the whole thing. No, just focus on voting. And can you imagine NBA owners sitting back laughing when they got that call? <laughs> right. You just have uh, to open up your venues for voting. <laughs> yeah, you can open up your venues. And now you have to have uh, sort of like social justice messaging in your campaigns, your, your commercials rather. 
This and, is a Black Lives Matter headband, you know. Yeah, and Done. so basically, and so you know, the, and so for the, you know, and so for the NBA, that's another marketing strategy, right? And so once again, you know, living in this country and living under capitalism and caring about like, you know, collective liberation means watching passion just get commodified and co-opted over and over again, and it, it burns people out. Okay, let's jump to, we're in an election cycle. We know we have Trump as our Republican contender, right? We've got Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on the other side. What do you think in terms of either side or what it all means? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, um, I mean, of course, Trump is, is, um, very leaning toward fascism, right? There's no other way to, there's no really no other way to look at that. However, there are other types of fascism, right? And I see fascism as the merger of corporate and state power. And I think the type of neoliberal policies that the Democrats support with basically handing over control of our entire lives to large companies like Google and Facebook is also fascist. Uh -oh. And I think we've moved so far to the right in this country that we now have both parties leaning in a very rightward direction. Erica, uh, don't jump up and shout. Let them uh, I, These Let are them not answer. my thoughts. These are Josh's. I'm letting Josh and talk. And so, uh, I mean, yes, we should vote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as far, I mean, it's, 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 it's abysmal, right? And so I don't really think about voting. I think voting is very much uh, a, a flawed theory of change very much ahistorical and takes away from the actual type of work that we need to do. I was on a call last night with, or I was on a Zoom meeting with public housing residents who were trying to come back to live in Russell after their, their housing had been demolished. And, um, uh, you know, those, these, are, these are mostly single mothers, uh, mostly black women with, you know, and, and, and so, uh, and, and so in a lot of nonprofits were on the call and they want to do voter registration drives with these residents. And so instead of offering people any sort of material relief, um, we're trying to register them to vote. And it's, it, and it's so embarrassing. And so, um, and that's why I think we really have to have a serious conversation about labor organizing. And, and if we really wanted to develop theories of change that were based on an actual political analysis, I think we would have to focus on organizing Amazon workers, organizing Walmart workers. And I think that's when you start to have a shift in this country where poor white people and the white working class start to realize that, hey, if we form solidarity with black communities who have the, who share largely the same material uh, reality and lack of resources that we have, uh, if, we, if we form solidarity with them, the state is gonna treat us the same way they treat them, right? There's something about getting hit over the head there's something about getting hit with a rubber bullet. There's something about getting hit with tear gas where you realize that whiteness will not protect you. And I don't think the white working class has ever experienced that. But if you bring people in, and that's one of the reasons the struggle is really the solution. There's no struggle in voting, right? Uh, uh, all we really have as poor people is our labor and our rent and our vote. Uh, and, and, and two of those things are very powerful mechanisms to withhold. And one is not so much. Uh, and so the ruling class doesn't really care if we vote or not, but they do care if they if we withhold our labor or our rent from them. And that's why tenant organizing and labor organizing are just much more difficult, much more painful, uh, but much sounder theories of change, I think. Because the dirty secret is they built the system from the beginning to dilute our votes. It was never meant for it to be one man, one vote. We got a whole system built on, the people talk about voter suppression, Voter suppression is as American as apple pie. Hello, electoral college. Hello, voter dilution. Yeah. So let's go back to that for me because you mentioned Mitch McConnell at the beginning. And, and I get asked this a lot being from Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky. I get asked this question, why do your people Mitch McConnell? Why do they vote against their own interests? And so we have this narrative that Eastern Kentucky supports Mitch. And the two things about that, uh, in e Eastern Kentucky is mostly owned by coal companies. Right. And so in those type of areas, you have high levels of voter suppression and voter fraud. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that Mitch McConnell comes from the ballot uh, is ridiculous. 
the, the, the wealthiest county in Kentucky is Oldham County right outside Louisville. Mitch McConnell was grown and incubated by the wealthy elite in Louisville, Kentucky, mostly the Brown family and the, and the founders of the Humana Corporation. The, the Jones family from the Humana Corporation actually mentored Mitch and pumped a lot of money into his campaign throughout the 80s. And so we have this narrative that somehow poor people created Mitch um, when in actuality he came from the Louisville elite and is part of that group. Well, let me just say that I'm not surprised by that, but I have been, Josh, it has been just really interesting to have you on the show because I've just learned a whole lot. I have been surprised by a lot of the things that you've said. I love that you like to name names <laughs> and call people out on their, what we call on the show, on their ish. So um, <laughs> thank you for being willing to do that. But before you go, tell us like, how do you remain hopeful, right? You're here, you talk about a lot of things, you talk about devastation. How do you still remain hopeful and believe that things are going to change at the rate we need, to, need it to in order for you to see it? Uh, I don't, sometimes, so a couple things about that. I, I feel like poor people have a higher resilience uh, for remaining hopeful. Uh, and, and so part of it is, you know, I was raised by my grandparents um, and my grandparents were, sh were sharecroppers for most of their early years. Uh, and so you're talking about people who, I don't, my grandfather said he didn't own a pair of shoes until he was 13 years old, wow. right? And so uh, they worked 16 hours a day, every day. They never took a vacation. They went, they left to go, that when they got married, they took like a three day vacation. That's it, they worked. And so those are, that's where I come from, right? And so um, there's such an obligation there to my people to fight uh, and, and really try to disrupt and dismantle these systems and believe that we're gonna win. And if we don't win, uh, you know, you just live to do that. And, and so when you fall down, you know, you've created, hopefully there are resources that have been created that other people can pick up and can continue that fight. But beyond that, uh, we had an election in Kentucky this year where Charles Booker uh, ran against Amy McGrath. Uh, Charles Booker is a black man from West Louisville, a uh, friend of mine, uh, didn't have a lot of money in his campaign. Here's Amy McGrath supported by, you know, people like Chuck Schumer, supported by a lot of uh, wealthy California interest, millions of dollars in her campaign, got out of campaign early, right? Um, Charles Booker didn't really get out early at all didn't even start running until really January. And so Charles Booker came within, I can, I'm not gonna quote the data because I haven't looked at it in a while, uh, but came very close to winning that election, right? And so here we have a state that's kind of synonymous with, with, with Trump, with Republicans, uh, with, with you know, rural white people are, um, are lumped in as being like Confederate flag. We're all Confederate flag waving racist you know the right kind of exploits us and the left just feels like we're too dumb to even mess with they just kind of wash their hands of us uh but we almost beat amy mcgrath and i believe if charles could have got it a little bit earlier charles would have won that election right and so that's a lot of young people that's a lot of poor and working class white people that came out and voted for charles and those things i think are very hopeful uh, i don't know if you got a chance to see um uh, tyler childers is a country singer from eastern kentucky he released a statement recently uh, on Black Lives Matter and uh, those kind of things make me very hopeful. There's a narrative here and there are stories that people aren't hearing and there's a story that we're being sold, right? And so there's a political interest in creating these differences and creating these stereotypes and perpetuating these stereotypes among poor people. Uh, and I just see that slowly eroding. Awesome. Um, and Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your story. And on Brokers, we're trying to remain hopeful too. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So Amber, why don't you, um, of course, yeah, we appreciate you. But Amber, let's tell the Brokers what homework they have for this episode. All right. So, you know, virtual school, school is still in session. So we got a little homework, y'all. Don't yes. be afraid. It's not too hard. Uh, the first is to follow Josh and his work on Twitter. Um, Josh's Twitter handle is at Joshua, J-O-S-H-U-A-P-O-E underscore capital L-O-U. So Joshua Poe underscore Lou. So follow him and then also follow at Root Research. Um, the word Root with a capital R and the word Research with a capital R all together. 
And then lastly, but not, um, but not least, y'all, go to rootsresearch.org. Um, learn the definition. What'd you say? Oh, root cause research. Root cause research. I don't know I'll be struggling with these websites. Hey, I know you do. <laughs> I'm, I'm eternally in virtual school. That's why my children be struggling. But it's <laughs> rootscauseresearch.org. And our challenge to you is to learn the counter definitions of these words that we've talked about today. So many of us have drank the Kool-Aid on what gentrification means, what capitalism means, what racial capitalism means. So go get a counter definition so that you can really understand what's actually going on out here in these streets. And not only can you understand it, but you can learn how to advocate better for yourself and your community. And if you are going to vote, you can put some power behind it because you know what's going on and you know the language. So follow Josh in Root Research and then visit RootsCauseResearch.org. And also I'm. donate too. So go visit, donate. but I'm sure they would <laughs> appreciate it if you donate as well. So y'all, as we close out this episode, I'm going to keep it really short and I'm just going to leave y'all with some wisdom from our sister, Naomi Osaka, when she wrote, um, I would like to thank my ancestors because every time I remember their blood runs through my veins, I'm reminded that I cannot lose. And I know that it can seem like there is so much that gets in the way of our progress, our success, our ability to thrive and live well. But then I remember where we come from and that's where I get more power. So thanks for tuning in and we look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of Brokish. Bye y'all. Okay. Um